If you are in your 20s and the early 90s and looking to be an artist, start a band, or start a revolution, New York's East Village is where you'd want to be. Before Green Juice and Giuliani, malt liquor was drank on stoops and heroin was sold in doorways. Dime bag bodegas and $1.50 falafel stands had yet to be displaced by cell phone stores and vape shops. Squatter punks battled cops with mustaches, beer guts, and outer borough accents in Tompkins Square Park, and the last vestiges of the politically charged legacies of Abby Hoffman and Allen Ginsberg slowly succumbed to rising real estate prices. I was there, and I needed a roommate. I placed a classified ad in the Village Voice, and a few days later, my next guest moved in. You might not know his name, but most likely you've heard of his artwork. His fine art photos hang in museums, but his process for creating them makes for an irresistible headline for the mainstream media. 2,000 naked people cover themselves with mud in the Dead Sea. 5,000 naked people gather at the Sydney Opera House. 18,000 naked people converge in Mexico City. You get the picture. I've witnessed this progression from downtown novelty to internationally known artist. New York's changed a lot since then. The East Village is no longer a neighborhood that fosters art or music or social movements, and our time spent living in an illegal storefront loft in Alphabet City is well in the past. But our close friendship still remains. Today, artist, family man, free speech advocate, and former Avenue C resident, Mr. Spencer Tunick. <laughs> All right, so we're recording. Spencer Tunick, thanks for sitting down, bud. How's your morning been so far? Great. I've been uh, isolating and quarantining in the lower Hudson Valley, 45 minutes north of New York. I live uh, here with my wife and kids and uh, just getting through it. We finally found a quiet place to have a conversation, man. What's your, fill me in, what's your, what's your morning routine? I know you're a big fan of coffee and hot tubs. Mm. Did I impede on your, on your routine this morning? Uh, uh, For some reason, uh, since the pandemic started i've been waking up around 4 a.m having a hard time to go to sleep and if i do get to sleep i usually then wake up at 8 30 but sometimes i don't and so i for the past uh 17 years i've been m- making my wife coffee in the morning she uh she's never made it in the morning and she fights me if i ask her and i still even though i've done it every day for 17 years i still try to get her to do it and she never will you switch it up you have like a you like a, like a og chock full of nuts or yeah you mess around with some some artisanal <laughs> suffering that's beans. a good question i just think in the morning you just want to like chug it down so morning coffee is always just chock full of nuts or something random. (laughs) We're not really thinking at that point. We're just sort of like, let's get up. And uh, I open all the windows in our bedroom. It's second floor and we have a door in our bedroom. So we open that up and you can see the Ramapo mountains. Do you see, I know you have a, you're in your, your home office slash barn right now, which is just a, a stone's throw away from your house. Do you try and make a point? Like for me personally, there's like that magic moment about 15 minutes into when you get coffee in your system. You're like, I could do anything right now. I'm so motivated on my brain is sharp. And then like, you really have to like seize that moment because it doesn't last for very long. Like you, you try and time it properly Oh sure. Um, that, with that a short, with a call. short commute like that. Definitely. That morning, that morning jar from that coffee sort of gets me in fights because I want Kristen to get naked and like pose in front of that (laughs) doorway with the mountains in the back room in the background. So I'm always trying to see if she'll do some artistic iPhone (laughs) picture, which is in a way sort of ridiculous, but it's, you know, an intimate moment for us. And on occasion, if we are sort of going out to dinner or doing something interesting later on in the day, she'll be more excited for the day. But if it's just any random day, she'll be like, she's like, nah, right. Just like, I'm not getting naked. Well, okay. Well, that, I guess that leads me into the the meat of our conversation. So, you know, you're, you're not the first photographer to ever shoot nudes, obviously, but I think the scale at which you've been able to develop this art form that you've created, I, as far as I know, it's, it's unprecedented, you know, it's like, it's, it's uniquely yours. And so, you know, I've been witness to the progression of this whole product that you've been able to like develop starting from just you shooting your roommates and me and (laughs) me putting on wings in a set of boxer shorts and like going on a Ferris wheel, at the San Gennaro festival. Um, and you know, just shooting our roommates and then 
to shooting, watching you shoot with five people or a hundred people and then culminating in a shoot that we did in Mexico city with, you know, 18,000 people. So you've been able to create these kind of visual landscapes. Like, is there something unique about the message that you're able to convey when you're using these landscapes of 10,000 people instead of 10 people? Like what, from a creative standpoint, have you been able to more effectively leverage? Well, when I'm working with a hundred people, it's more of a sort of a group photograph of a uh, fireman in front of their truck or, you know, it, it, or a class photo. It kind of has that sort of essence. Um, but when I'm working with 10,000 people or 5,000 people, the bodies take on the form of a substance or, or, and become very close to uh, nature, very much like, you know, a million blades of grass in a field or a beach with uh, rocks or so it becomes very like very close to environmental art or land art. And so just working with the body as an abstraction, as a substance, as this form of clay that's getting larger and smaller because the bodies are so close together that you can't see the differentiation of space in between them. It becomes quite a new a new way of looking at the world. You know, you just don't see this. You quite possibly see it in the negative connotations in war, but you never see it yeah. in art and life. I mean, I think that's what's one of the most interesting things that when I describe some of these trips that I've been on or I describe being friends with you and what you do, it, immediately when you say nude, it, it evokes this sense of, of eroticism, you know, and, and I think that's one of the most interesting things that if anyone's ever been to your installations that they understand that it's like decidedly not that, not necessarily by design, but just in terms of execution, like there's so many people, it becomes abstract. And it's like, even if you try to be, you know, like perverse and, you know, lurid, it, it, it's just almost impossible because it becomes this like sea of, of skin. And, and I think it's really interesting how non-sexual 10,000 people naked together, like actually becomes, you know, that's, it's a really fascinating aspect of what you do. Yeah. I think asking people to arrive at 4 a.m. to get naked at sunrise around 5 30 a.m. The, you know, any idea of uh, sexuality sort of falls from the wayside quite quickly when they realize one, what are they standing in the middle of a city street at 530 in the morning for? And uh, two, oh, we have to start getting into positions and making art. And so uh, they realize when participating that they're collaborators in making an artwork together and that they really want to make this artwork. So they, they sort of for a while forget about the dynamics of sexual attraction. And so, uh, of course, afterwards, I can't control that, you know, people can go to <laughs> breakfast with each other or, you know, possibly go to a party afterwards. But during the making of the art, it's really serious. But what's what's the sweet spot for you in terms of, of crowd size, where it becomes something that's still kind of manageable and intimate, as opposed to just this seascape of, of skin that you've talked about? Like a hundred people, a thousand. I mean, most people, if you told them that you're like capable of, of corralling a hundred people and getting them naked would think that that's ridiculous and a massive size, but that's incredibly small for the scale that you normally work on. Right. Well, I, I think sometimes when I'm working with uh, 500 or less people, it's a, it's a good amount of people, but sometimes when I'm working with 800, a thousand people, I don't quite get the work. I, it doesn't really come out well for me. And so I like to work with the lower hundreds or go into the four thousands or five thousands. Well, that's interesting. Cause you also, you still, you do a lot of, of individual work still like with one person or a couple. Is it, is that just a matter of practicality? Like it's just, it's not possible or practical to do these large scale installations more than, you know, once or twice a year, or is there something just intrinsically more intimate about shooting an individual that you still kind of strive for and, and, Miss. Well, I think that, you know, well, I started out working with individual portraits, one-on-one -on -one nudes, just like the one I took of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that We'll get into that story later. But when you start out doing something, there's sort of a nostalgic quality to your early works. And I'm one who likes to go back to nostalgia and recreate that feel of just talking to one person, hearing their stories, going for breakfast with them afterwards, just the whole process of working with an individual besides the actual art making is quite fulfilling because when you work with a, you know, 500 people naked, you, it's hard to have that, that intimacy. 
And so, you know, I still love doing individual works because of that connection to one person. And also, I feel I still have a voice to, to make works uh, individually. And I, and I love, I'm, I'm the type of artist that doesn't like to go uh, to do a series and then stop it and then move on to something else. I like to create series and then just work with them throughout my lives. Well, I mean, you're fortunate too, because, you know, I've talked to some, some different artists that almost reminisce about, you know, there's something fantastic about playing if you're a musical artist you're playing a festival show in front of half a million people like there's something pretty amazing about that but i think if you dig a little deeper almost every artist kind of yearns for those days of having a small intimate club date where there's like sweat dripping and the people are two feet away instead of behind a barrier you know but once you become a certain level of a musical artist you you can't do that you know i mean the rolling stones can't just like play at mercury lounge or whatever but i think it's pretty cool that you can operate on both of these levels pretty much at will right definitely i sometimes when i'm working with a thousand people or or okay not a thousand but let's say sometimes when i'm working with like 500 people and of course the idea of nudity you think of 500 people and you think that in your mind, it feels like it's 5,000 people because they're naked. So it feels big, but, um, 500 people gathering 500 people is relatively equivalent to a small, a small concert, you know? So it, it is manageable, but the intimacy is not there. I think the intimacy comes in when you're working with around 25 people, you know, one to 25 people. You can actually see individual faces and speak to individual people rather than just like, hey, you 50 yards away, your tattoo's showing, roll over. Or, you know, like yeah. you're not able to actually communicate as a as an individual. And you could see if someone's holding up a peace sign in the photograph or making a face that you don't want them to make or, yeah. you know, you can a little bit more control, so, you know, and then just more you could pay more just more attention to each body's individual positioning. Well, hell, well, let me ask you this. So I, I think one of the most interesting things that I've gotten experience working with you and, you know, being close friends with you is just watching how it's such a participatory event with everybody who comes for these installations. Everybody brings their own personal emotional baggage and motivations and reasons for being there. And I think that's why it's so special. I mean, you have everybody from people who just wanted to stay up all night drinking and go to a cool art event at dawn. And then you also have people who are personally fans of yours who travel and make it an event for your installation. But more more importantly, there's a lot of people that I've noticed that have, you know, they say they have body issues, they're extremely overweight, or they've been physically abused, or there's something very cathartic about exposing themselves in a public way like that. Sometimes it's an extremely political motivation, like when we shot in Mexico, like 18,000 people standing naked in the Zocalo, you know, the heart of Central America, like that's a political statement. So with all these divergent motivations and and meanings like as a creator how do you formulate a, like a cohesive definition of what the work means well it's like nature the body is nature in mass so you can put that body in a in a forest and it might not it, it might connect to either the forest or how the body becomes the city and the body might become the urban element in a, in a natural setting. So it just depends on where this organism, where the bodies as a collective shape goes. If the, if the bodies are in front of the presidential palace in the Zocalo, that's going to be a pretty powerful work because it's going to bring up connotations of freedom and government's control over your identity and uh, and environmental issues and everything from social issues to politics. So, But if you take that same group in that same position and bring them someplace else, the work might have a different meaning. So I think that it just depends on how, how brave the participant is and how brave the organization is and how brave I am to bring the bodies in front, uh, confronting palaces of uh, justice or, or putting them along a highway and that can bring up uh, other connotations. So yeah, so it's about placement. So you're saying the location and the pre-production of where that installation takes place is really where like the kind of the concept really starts. And then once the people get there, it just kind of takes on its own sense of, of, of meaning. It's also the position of the body. You can have people standing in as resistance or or you can have people crumpled up on the ground as you know and sort of a position of like a loss of their ability to stand and there's death connotations so 
there's just so many uh, ways that you can twist it slightly to bring up what you want to do as an artist. An example would be a work that I didn't want, even my first work that I did in front of the United Nations. I had a group work in 1994. I had 25 people that wanted to uh, pose for me individually, and I decided to get everyone together. And I could have photographed everyone on Governor's Island or, you know, in Central Park, but I decided to do 25 to 28 people nude in front of, you know, the epicenter of world politics, United Nations. And in, in that picture, I had people curl up in balls. So obviously that was about the fragility of the human condition and um, also about current war and uh, in Rwanda. And so, so I, I had things going on in my mind and I created a position and a location that was sort of a, a personal protest. And then I brought all the body people, I say bodies, but people to um, the next avenue and everyone formed a zigzagging line, which had everything to do with abstraction and land art and wasn't so much political. The only thing political about that work was that cars were stopped and and that uh, people were naked. And do you ever in execution have the concept kind of morph into something else almost accidentally? Like you'll have, you'll have your location set, you'll have like a vision of what you want to create, but just kind of looking at the pictures afterwards, like let's say you do three or four different positions and one of the positions kind of took on a meaning that you didn't really intend either for better or for worse. Well, let's say the work in San Sebastian. Were you in San Sebastian? (laughs) Yes, you were. Yeah. yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, You were with me, Justin, in San Sebastian. And the reason Justin was with me is because Justin uh, is a friend besides from the fact that he's a photographer and a songwriter. Do people know you're a songwriter? No, let's keep that. Okay, we'll, we'll cut that on out. The low, yeah. On the down low. <laughs> uh, besides from the fact that he's a photographer, um, he he also just knows his way around a camera. And um, and so I, when I need help, I'd rather have a friend helping me with with a, my camera technical stuff than uh, than a professional uh, photography assistant. Although he was a professional photography assistant. Wait, who I could speak in a sense, Sebastian? Do you remember we got struck by lightning on that shoot? Do you remember that? Oh, that's all. Yeah, that wasn't that in my clause, like in my contract that you signed with me. If struck by lightning, I am not responsible. We actually, I mean, it's a little bit of an overstatement, but we were standing on a rainy beach with electricity in the air holding an umbrella and like something arced like we both were like did we like there wasn't straight up like cartoonish smoke coming from our feet but i was like yeah we just we just got hit by lightning like something happened who had the umbrella i think i did so i I think you did yeah yeah but i I heard it it was like pop it's like yeah whoa maybe we shouldn't be standing you know in an electric storm with an umbrella you know live and learn Uh, on a on a scissor lift that is. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, no, so back to San Sebastian. So was there, did you do a position there that okay, kind of had a switch, connotation? Let's you just didn't... switch from San Sebastian to Valencia. I'm sorry. It was in Valencia that I did uh, the work that I'm talking about. So in Valencia, but we got electrocuted in San Sebastian. So let's talk about Valencia because I, it's not about San, San Sebastian, the story I want to tell. So in Valencia, I had uh, women and men separated and then women standing on the men's chest as they're lying. So I had three setups, one where the men were on their backs and the women were standing on their one foot on their chest. The other one, the women, the men were on their backs and the women were standing next to them. And then the third setup was the men on their backs and the women's re- the women reaching, pulling them up, sort of, you know, helping, helping them. them get it. And so, yeah. you know, it's a big decision which one to choose. And you know, each of them has so much meaning. And so one is about sort of conquering and a little bit more hard, you know, the the foot on the chest. The other one is more sort of about shape and logs, the women standing by the men, but they could also be perceived as dead and the women alive. And then the third one, when you're pulling, you know, when you're helping a man up while he's lying on the ground and the woman is reaching down to help him up, kind of leaning over. Well, I felt that worked best work best. And if I had done the other chosen, the other setups to, to show within the body of work, it might have uh, not worked. And so I do many setups to create the right feeling for the eventual end result. But of course I might show the other works later on if, but right now it's just the women reaching down and pulling up the men slightly. 
And do you think you have a pretty good grasp of how people perceive your work? Has there been any missteps or situations where you really intended it to mean something, maybe not even politically or not overtly, but it was perceived in a different way and you've had some, some blowback from it? Um, no. Or do you, do you think you pretty, you pretty much have a pretty solid idea of when you put something out, like you have maybe your personal uh, silent meeting of what it means, but you also understand how the public's going to perceive it. Right. I, I, I know how uh, people will perceive the work. You know, I, I'm definitely uh, when I create a work and often if I'm, if I have a prop involved and um, such as people holding flowers or discs or, um, or painted. I, I definitely know how I, I've worked out all the scenarios that how people are going to read into that, um, whether they read into 5,000 people painted in shades of blue as an environmental photograph, or they read into it as using the works on the body related to the, the sea or how it's related to mar the maritime history of a certain area. So basically what I'm saying is that I know I, I'm, I'm never really surprised how people react to the work, but I'm always surprised with the stories that people tell of their individual experiences. Although I don't use those stories in my art, you know, I don't show the stories next to the art until now, until recently, because I'm in an exhibition called uh, Life During Wartime, where I actually put the statements of the participants next to the photographs. But uh, that's always surprising. I think that's what makes your work so special. And I think that's why it resonates so powerfully because it's not just the tens of thousands of people who've experienced just your artwork in its finished form, but it's the hundreds of thousands of people that have actually participated in it. And they all have their extremely evocative memories and experiences, and it means something different to them. And I, I think that it's almost like there's like a, a twofold process happening when you create these works. There's like a final product that you're documenting, but it's also like, it's an experience, you know, that oh, so many of these people respond to. And I think that's, what's, what's really interesting about it. You know, as opposed to like a photographer who takes a portrait of somebody and say, like, that person's experience probably wasn't that profound, even though you have this great product captured. But in your work, there's so many people that were involved in that on such an emotional level that it's, it really, I think it, I think it resonates. It shows through in the work. You know, when people pose for me, if uh, 3000 people fill up a square in a city, they're not just coming from the surrounding thousand meters, uh, you know, and they're not rolling out of bed close by. They're traveling from very far distances often to to get there for sunrise and just unbelievable community of uh participants so willing and so generous to get naked and get up at so early in the morning <laughs> of course but that that comes with a lot of responsibility right i mean you must really does that add an extra layer of anxiety because you're not just dealing with models who got paid money and they're there to work and you're in charge it's like you're dealing with people that are really you know they, they get assigned print but ultimately they're doing it because they're invested in in the work and right you know they really they want to be part of it and so do you does that add anxiety sometimes having that responsibility well, you know, uh, most artists can create a work uh, inside their studio, and then when it's ready, they could exhibit it to a, an audience within a controlled context of a gallery or a museum space. But I'm actually making the work in public, and so I'm making mistakes and having triumphs in public. Uh, so it's a, lot, it's a lot of pressure because a museum will commission you, and then you have to you sort of have to make good works or relatively good works in order not only to, uh, there's a lot, there's money. There's a lot of money on this online. I mean, in terms of production, there's a lot of people invested in time and, you know, I guess, I guess right. more than anything, I know what the answer to this. It's, ex it's extremely anxiety inducing. And I guess what I'm getting at is like, you handle it very well. Um, like I've watched you on so many occasions where I guess the funniest thing you ever seen, you ever seen a cat who like sees a bird and like his, like, it's just like I've seen you in a, a state where you're just so focused and so ridden with anxiety, but also like laser focused on, on your objective and you handle it very well. Yeah. Know, I try to get every, everything away. You know, I try to just concentrate with the people, the, all the individuals coming together collectively in front of me, like whether it's a hundred people or a thousand people and just uh, getting into the zone of like, getting the work done, not only to please my own, please my vision that I had, but also to 
to make sure everyone gets through the positions in a safe manner and that we can get through all the positions because I just don't want to do one photograph that whole morning. I want to create a series of works. I want to create a sort of a waltz through the city, you know, like I want to create a body of work. So I'm very focused, but I'm also, you know, but sometimes I forget things like on my hand, I'll write down, um, what do I write down? You write calm, focus, focus, tight. What's the third one? Tight. Tight. Calm, focus, tight. So I've always written this on my hand with Sharpie before I work and calm is really about just Just, remaining calm and breathe. Yeah. Breathe. Focus is not only about focus mentally, but focusing, but actually focusing. Sometimes you forget the focus because so, you know, the pressure. Well, let's just explain. So the the camera that you use, uh, it's a rangefinder camera. We'll use a couple, but a lot of times you use a rangefinder and the view that you see through the viewfinder is not actually what the lens is seeing. They're very similar, but right. they're not the exact same thing. So it's possible to look through the viewfinder and have the lens completely not focused. Right. And that is, happened in Buffalo. We'll ruin the photo. That happened in Buffalo, New York. And I didn't focus any of the photographs. They were all out of focus except the one <laughs> roll that had all the setups. Was I on? Was that, was that me? I'm not even going to admit to that. Uh, that was my right. totally my fault. But the other, let me say the other, um, the other thing is uh, the other, the, the tight means um, to just, you know, be tight, you know, just be tight, but also hold the camera tight because these cameras are big and there could be shutter shake. And you got to remember to hold the camera tight or you'll have sort of a, a shaking final image that comes out. I just, it's funny because I think our personal experiences are, are almost completely opposite. So my, my role and responsibility, albeit extremely important because I'm the one that is the last person to put the film in the camera and take it out and make sure that the settings are right. So it, it's very important, but it's also extremely specialized and extremely small relatively. So like, I am so focused on like making sure that one of my best friends doesn't get his shoot messed up because I screwed up. So I'm laser focused on the specific, whereas like you're standing up or we're standing on top of uh, a cherry picker looking at sometimes 10,000 people. And you have to have the focus of like, Oh, there's a person 200 yards in the distance, like laughing and holding up a peace sign and he's going to ruin it for the other 9,000, 900, 9,000 people or whatever. So, you know, it's really, it's, it's interesting. Sometimes like an entire shoot will go by and I just like, I didn't even get to experience it because I'm so focused. And you on the other hand, or have to experience every minutia of the shoot to make sure that it's, Right. You know, execute your vision. I don't, I don't have the money to have just someone standing next to me just to look at everything that I might find in the background as a red flag, as an annoyance. I once had a friend do that for me and he pointed out everything that I would have pointed out. And I was like, we should take this guy everywhere. <laughs> and then I realized, do I really have a budget to pay someone just to stand there and be my eyes? A second set yeah, of eyes. And yeah. I, I've always wished that I was uh, had enough, enough enough money as as an artist to have that additional crew member that just stood there and did nothing except look. But I think we have a pretty tight crew now. I feel like we've been able to execute like we've kind of pulled off some miracles in my in my opinion. You know, like some of the circumstances that we've had to operate under, um, and I don't think I've ever really seen you not get the shot. Right. You know, that's really it. Started out early with my friend John Porcelli and my former producer who would just create these organizational miracles and really worked it with the, with the volunteers and sometimes the army and the police and the museums to make, to just have, have a space for me to like just concentrate on the art and not sort of protesters coming in or police or, you know, it just, uh, he really helped me out. And so, uh, so just having a, a great core team that, uh, and my, my assistants in production to really help me focus on just the models, just the idea that I have and had, and not all the ancillary things around me, such as, are the lights going to go off? Uh, why can't we use this, this road? The, it's a shorter distance from the model's clothing to the location. Why do we have to go around the block? And all these things I don't have to worry about, even though I do notice, I'm, I, I kind of know yeah. everything. Well, a lot of that's, on. I mean, I've, you definitely are, are detail oriented, but I think a lot of those, not a lot of those issues are, are sussed out and addressed in pre-production. And I think right. it's all about like your pre-production is really tight. So the day of the shoot, all you have to do is, Get your frame, 
direct the people and make sure that everything's according to your vision. You're not having to deal with police. You're not having to deal with, you know, even rain. Somehow you have a really good rain karma as well. I have to, like, there's a one shoot in Amsterdam. I swear I would like down to 40 seconds. You got the shot and then it started to pour rain. Yeah, we had a sandstorm in the desert in Nevada that came over us and I still got the photograph. Um, we got this great photograph in Ireland filling up a uh, sea, uh, s- sort of a sea bar, uh, concrete sea bar with uh, 2,500 people. And then a storm it came in right after freezing. I got my last setup. But thank God yeah. I did it. And then people just quit after that. <laughs> um, so you mentioned you mentioned police. Like you have a very kind of checkered history with 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 police, especially in New York City. I know you've been arrested a lot of times. Um, I was fortunate enough to be with you for one of those, or unfortunate, I should say. Have you noticed a difference? I just remember like, literally the, the the time we got arrested, there was a whole legal case that went through it. We can talk about that later if you like. But I just thought it was so ironic that you essentially were not able to shoot any of your installations in your hometown. And right after that, we traveled to, I think it was Barcelona. And the, basically the city of Barcelona gave us a convention center to go ahead and execute your vision, you know? And then we also, I remember when, when Chavez was alive, we went to Venezuela and we had like a thousand military police at our disposal, which was almost a little creepy because there was really only about a thousand participants. Like that was a very peculiar vibe on that shoot, but you know, nonetheless, it was with their consent and endorsement and like speak to the irony of having to travel outside of your hometown or your home country in order to, to make these works happen. Right. You know, the great thing about New York is that there's a a law that protects artists from working with the nude in public space. So even though I was being arrested, I was actually being arrested against the law. People thought I was breaking the law, but I actually wasn't. I was acting within my rights. And Mayor Giuliani was breaking the law by not giving me a permit and threatening me with arrest and the models with arrest. So I was just acting on my First Amendment rights in New York to make art with the naked body in public space. So yeah, so I was arrested many times. I was handcuffed. I was behind bars. You were arrested with me, um, Justin, in Times Square, and they put us both in a cop car. <laughs> and I, put- I remember it was like a, it was like a Sunday morning. And so by the time they brought us down to central booking in downtown Manhattan, like the jail was so full, we were basically like in, on a waiting list. We like sat in a cop car handcuffed waiting to get into jail. And I was like, what has my life become right now? Um, my wonderful lawyer got all the charges uh, eventually dismissed, Ron Kuby. And then the NC- NYCLU took the case up to the Supreme Court and and then uh, Justice Ginsburg saw the uh, the case and decided that I had the right to do my work, remanded the case back down to the New York City federal courts where I had won at the highest level. And then, which is usually done in, in a death row scenario, they uh, reappealed to the Supreme Court to the entire court. So the entire court, including Scalia and Ginsburg and Thomas, they were all looking at naked photos in the the summer of 2000. And and eventually they remanded the case back down. Giuliani was reprimanded. That's amazing. Just the whole scenario. And so, you know, my my backstory. So I was with you. I got arrested. Um, I ended up having to do one day of community service. I picked up trash in Tompkins Square Park and you know, whatever. I think I had a $40 court fee and then had to do a day of community service. I did my service, went to buy all my court fee and the, the, the service hadn't been entered into the system or something. So I couldn't pay the fee or, and I was going on vacation the next day and I was like, I'll deal with it. And I get back. So while I was away in Mexico with my family, they served a warrant at my apartment, like woke up my roommates. I left the, yeah, I got a message being like, um, some, some armed men came looking for you. Can you address this as soon as possible? So, (laughs) yeah, if, if not in the current political context, I'd like to take one more opportunity to say, fuck you to Giuliani. Like since way back when that guy is, it's just a real piece of work. So yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, um, not, not being able to work in New York is, was a difficult thing. So I just, decided not to apply for permits and just do the works underground. And that's how I created my work with the threat of arrest. So I always had this time constraint and pressure put on me of making the works within maybe 
10 or 15 minutes as opposed to like I do it now where I have a few hours to do many setups. So I'm still sort of that, I'm still conditioned in a, in to make works to make good works quickly uh, because of the threat of arrest. So if a storm is coming now, or if I have a time limit with the sun, I'm always good under pressure just because the police was always, was always after me and the participant. Uh, with the threat of the police, it kind of forced you to, you know, train at altitude, if you will, in terms of being expedient and getting what you need quickly. And uh, yeah, because, uh, you know, the idea of getting arrested the first time when I had a uh, a friend, Michael Weiner, climb a 10-foot red Christmas ball at Rockefeller Center naked, and we both were arrested. I, that was kind of like interesting and fun and, and uh, sort of an adventure. <laughs> but, uh, you know, after the, after the third arrest, you're like, oh, this, is, this could is be dangerous. Yeah. Plus, you work on something for maybe a half a year, and then it's just taken away from you. Your artwork is taken away from you before you even make it like that. And it's like, you know, it's getting serious now. I'm getting thrown in jail. Jail could be dangerous, you know. So that's why my lawyers decided to file First Amendment federal uh, emergency lawsuit against the mayor of the city and the police commissioner. All right, let's switch gears for a second from the police to what's your relationship with the media? Because although you have one foot firmly in the fine art world, uh, because of the nature, I guess for lack of a better word, for the, the sensational nature by which you make your art with thousands of naked people and public spaces, like it lends itself really well to the mainstream media covering it, which is a good thing in some cases because it gets your work out there and it also gets the message out there for some of the causes that you've worked for, whether it's global climate change with Greenpeace or for women's issues. But at the same time, sometimes you have to explain your art through the lens of somebody who's not necessarily experienced it talking or experiencing art. Like what are some of the challenges of having to deal with the media in that context? You know, it's very difficult to uh, to be an artist and get work in the mass media, but also get, you know, get written about, you know, and get into uh, get commissioned from museums. And I've been able to do that, but it's extremely difficult. If uh, artists like Vanessa Beecroft decided to choose to do all her works outside in public space, she would have a very difficult time with her art career. And it, it might not be like it is now, but once you... When you step outside of an enclosed environment with the naked body, it immediately becomes sensational. So I try to kind of tone down half the work that I do is toning down the sensational and trying to walk people through, you know, how the body can be taken seriously naked, even though it's reaching, it's getting into some of the, the big newspapers or on CNN or it's being, you know, it's like this very difficult waltz. But for art, for an artist to just want to be like, you know, in hipster art magazines with editions of 3000, that's a cool thing too. But like, who are you really uh, reaching and are you really changing the changing things? And are, are you an elitist? So I try so to is be that, an elitist. So that's kind of the fine line or the payoff that you have to have to have in order to have coverage in the mainstream media and be able to expose this art to these wide audiences. You know, you almost have to like, untrain the media to not focus on this is this is not a public orgy this isn't a publicity stunt this isn't like this sensational crazy wacky thing it's just like you're you're creating art it's something very serious but it's it's difficult to sometimes force them to to have the right angle you know and not and not focus on like the obvious sensational aspects of it right and you would think in 2000 19 or 2020 people would ask you not the same questions but they still you know the mass media will say oh is this art or is this shock art and it's like it's like oh god it's like let's go someplace else with that and uh <laughs> but a good way to hurt an artist's feelings is to uh refer to their work as a stunt or a sh shock art or is this art they they know they're pushing your buttons and so and tell me about the stay apart together project that you're working on right now yeah. Um, stay apart together. It, I was driving down the street in my hometown and there was a movie theater. Uh, there is a movie theater and on the billboard, uh, someone put a get together the, the words uh, stay apart together in those plastic letterings, you know, the large plastic lettering. And that's where I got the title. My, a friend of mine, Alo from uh, Mexico, 
from the Yucatan emailed me and said, hey, do you ha- did you ever think about doing uh, group works on communal chats, webinars, sort of, uh, sort of like Zoom or uh, Blue Jeans or other uh, companies? And I had thought about that before, but it's so hard to organize you know, people from around the world and I couldn't do it alone. And he said he would help. He said he wanted to help. He has an arts group called Studio 333 in Merida, Mexico, in the Yucatan. And he has a team that would be willing to help organize people around the world to pose for me on these group chat platforms. And so I I put out the word to people who had posed for me in the past. And we've got, we got people signing up from Pakistan to India, to Malaysia, um, most recently Saudi Arabia, Australia, the US, and they're all coming together to get naked on a computer screen. And then what I'll do is to get the photograph. I mean, that's that's pretty amazing. Just all those countries you've listed, with the exception of Australia and the US, of countries that we've never been able to shoot in. And we never will be able to shoot in. So for someone to be brave enough to uh, get naked, even though it's in their own house, but be included on this in this photograph is quite wonderful. You know, not only for them, but also for me to know that there are people rock stars out there, naked rock stars willing to uh, get naked for art in countries that are very conservative. And so how I would get the photograph, I thought I could photograph the screen with my digital camera with a lot of megapixels. And I thought, you know something, I just want to do these screen grabs. I'll just screen grab from the upper left-hand corner down to the lower right-hand corner. And that- So you're just a, your final product of this piece is literally like screen 72 dpi screen res the screen capture it's a screen capture right and so um i never thought of these works as being big works where you need a lot of megapixels i thought of i thought of it more like flowing and very much part of the the computer very much part me being really part of the 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 conference and you know which turned into sort of an, an art grid and so how did how did the pandemic play into that i mean these countries are places that you probably never would have gotten to shoot otherwise, but is it a product of not being able to shoot people even in one state over, or did it, is it just a coincidence? Well, my commissions is where I, I make most of the money for me to survive as an artist and to afford my uh, my home and my mortgage and my health insurance and kids. And so uh, when the pandemic hit, I knew I had a uh, installation canceled in Denmark. I was part of uh, an art biennial at, um, in Herning, Denmark at, at the uh, Hart Contemporary Museum of Art. And uh, it was postponed till 2021. And so immediately I was like, not only do I don't have an income, but I don't, I can't make my work anymore because my work is about getting people very close together, nude. And now we're in a pandemic. Uh, so I, I didn't know what to do. And uh, I was sort of... I mean, it's pretty, pretty ingenious the way you've been able to adapt that. Yeah. So a combination of both our minds coming together, Alonzo from the Yucatan and myself, and he helped, he, did, he does the back end and I create these works of sometimes 49 people at a time, sometimes 25 people at a time to form the perfect grid, sometimes nine people and sometimes diptychs. And you can see them on my Instagram. That's where I post them for now. And that's at, uh, at Spencer Tunic on Instagram. Right. And so just getting these people together, including doctors who have come home from, you know, the COVID emergency rooms to pose in a work or um, nurses and first responders, as well as artists. And, you know, just it's just amazing uh, how therapeutic it was for them to make art when you're isolated at home, you feel connected to people on a on a group level, on a a communal artistic level. You know, when you think about your screen, you always think about, oh, what can I watch from it? What, what, what does it give me? You know, you know, uh, passive, passive digestion of, of, of material. Right. But how, and then when you have a group chat, it's like, are you really making art unless it's like music? And so, uh, I, I try to, uh, do these nude group works on these conference chats and it really worked out wonderfully and uh, I'm still making them and people are still quarantining. You know, it's even though we have this idea that everyone's going out into public now, there are countries, (laughs) there are places where people are still in fear and, and they should be as the rates are, are some countries, the rates are, are rising again. And so, yeah, I mean, and your work is extremely close contact. So, I mean, it's one thing for 
New York City to open up and to sit on a patio with a mask or not and have a beer. But it's another thing to like literally like pile yourself next to a thousand naked bodies for half an hour. But if I had to, I could uh, change my work to have people separated by six feet or or nine feet. And I could have people wear masks, but I could change it. So if there was a brave uh, institution that let me have a little bit more freedom, I, you know, I think still think a commission could happen. So it's, you know, to be able to still make my work within these times of COVID-19, I think it's a gift. And I'm just so lucky to all the participants that signed up. Definitely go check out his work at spencertunic.com and at spencertunic on Instagram Um, is the... Are both of those installations available on both platforms or is there different? What can they find at your website versus Instagram? Uh, My website is just a a mishmash of years of different series and works and some video. And my uh, my Instagram is where I'm, you know, Instagram now is the magazine of the world. So uh, I post most uh, of the series on there. And then the unedited version is in an online museum exhibit called Life during wartime and the website is life during wartime.org that's live now life during wartime.org yeah. i can check that out yeah um Let's so talk i guess about that, you getting naked though <laughs> uh, it's been a long time since i've posed for you people always say oh you're going to work with spencer tunic are you going to get naked i'm like not for lack of interest it's just like i did that so i was you know i was i'm like one of your og models right i think in 1992 i read an ad in a in the village voice that someone needed a roommate and at the end of the ad at the bottom it said no livestock (laughs) when i read that i was like i want to move there and that's how i found you i showed up and i was the one who said hey can i live on that shelf in your loft that was like that was the kind of like canary in the coal mine to make sure that the person had a sense of humor for, you know, nonlinear and, and non sequiturs. I was like, if they don't think that's funny, I don't know if we could live together. And we're, you know, we've been thick as thieves ever since then. Right. And um, then on occasion, it's not that you're not a naked model, but I, I don't shoot models. I shoot everyday people. On occasion, maybe once or twice, you said to me, Spence, sure, you need someone, I'll get naked for you. And we've made some, uh, we've made one or two beautiful works. So if anyone wants to see Justin naked, just email me at projects at spencerdunic.com. I remember this. I, listen, if this didn't actually happen, if someone was telling this to me, I'd be like, that's bullshit. That didn't really happen. But I swear to you, and you can attest to this, doing a shoot, um, probably 92 early 90s on fifth avenue in front of lord and taylor completely naked early in the morning and after we did the shoot i couldn't find the car like the car matt had moved the car it was I literally was running down 52nd street like completely nude like kind of laughing but also a little bit panicking like trying to find a car like literally streaking down the street in in broad daylight yeah we all came up together with a in a car and then you left your clothing in the car. And then when, when it was when we were finished shooting, the car was gone. <laughs> so you're completely naked and panicking. And uh, finally, you found the car, <laughs> jumped, jumped in, and then we had a great breakfast at Valselka's. Um, oh, that's ridiculous. Uh, what are some of the other? I mean, I, I can't even list all the places. But, you know, I've experienced five thousand naked people inside the city opera house. We've been to the Dead Sea. Um, 19,000 people in Mexico City. We've been to the Blarney Castle. I mean, so many amazing places. Is there anything that really sticks out to you? And like, not necessarily from a, a creative standpoint, but there's a real communal aspect of the way we do these shoots because there's 10 of us that are together pretty much nonstop for a week straight. And there's a lot of funny moments that happen. Is there any like particular memories from any of the shoots that, that you that stand out? Well, sometimes, you know, you have such great experiences in the city and with the organ organizers. So you kind of put that up to the top tier of the top 10 because you just enjoy the people so much and the city so much. And so when we were at Bruges, we had, we ate at that Italian restaurant every uh, night. And I just remember how, you know, wonderful the city was to me and the chocolatier there, the guy, the head chocolate maker who owned this big store created a whole diorama of me shooting naked people i was made out of chocolate and the naked people on the bridge was made out of chocolate and it was in his window of a store and that was that was fantastic it's funny the things that 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 resonate and and stay in your mind i mean like the experience of shooting in sydney at the opera house is you know one of the top memories of that trip but 
slightly below it. Number two, the buffet at the hotel. <laughs> it's an, like one of the best breakfast buffets I've ever had. Yeah, you know? And I know you're a big the, fan of omelet bars. Yeah, so. something about like that, the omelet bars. <laughs> <laughs> something about that buffet in Sydney, I think when they put you at, at a hotel that's uh, not so much a boutique hotel, but like a sort of a Marriott or Hilton, they'll have like every nationality of food. So they'll have like a Japanese breakfast with sticky beans and, and, you know, you'll get every, you know, a thousand different types of small yogurt fruit cups. (laughs) (laughs) Just, well, I do remember lucky, you know, I've, I've, I've learned a lot from you over the years and we've had a lot of great times, but I can say like one of the most important lessons you've taught me is if you're at a party and they're having past appetizers, Post up by the kitchen. That's the pro move. <laughs> well, well played, sir. <laughs> yeah, well, I learned from uh, years of going. My dad was a hotel photographer and shot a lot of uh, weddings. And I, I, I've learned that, you know, you really got to hold back on the appetizers, you know, because like, you're just not going to get to that meal and the meal, you know, you never know if it's going to be good or not, but you, know, you got to learn how to hold back, you know, so you can. That's true. But don't, don't be afraid to stuff a crab leg in your sock for later. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I love that scene from trading places uh, where uh, Dan Aykroyd, you know, stuffs all this salmon in his Christmas suit. I love that scene. Yeah. Oh man. Well, listen, thanks for sitting down, Spence. Um, you know, we've spent a lot of time together, but I, and some of this stuff has never really been, you know, spoken about directly. And so it's good to really get to get inside your head for a bit. And, um, I wish you best of luck with that project, big hug to the family. And, uh, hopefully I'll see you in person real soon. Yeah. And also just in case I do have two artist books on my website, if you're interested, you know, Oh yeah, go ahead and give that plug. You can, those are available at spencertunic.com. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead and buy those. They're, they're, they're incredible. And I, I guarantee you that there's some imagery in there that you, you won't see anywhere else. Yeah. So all that money goes to my kids college. fund. <laughs> <laughs> Spencer Um, Thanks for sitting down, bud. I love you. Stay all safe. Right, Justin. See Bye. ya. This episode of the plug was produced by Bucci with audio engineering and original music by Peter Buckingham. Thanks for listening. And a huge thanks to today's guests for dropping in. If you like this episode, hit subscribe and be sure to tune in for future conversations.